Um, so now we go to the next talk and our speaker is Professor Prabhat Ranjan. Can I have the slide please? So what I understand is Professor Ranjan, a highly accomplished uh, scientist, speaker, and he, he is the Vice Chancellor of the Can I start the voice or stop it? Your voice broke. Soral? Dr. Krona, should I start? Uh, <laughs> I wanted to Just give you the full introduction. Just a okay. second. Yes, yes, sir. Mansi, can we have a slide, please? Mansi? Yes, it's there. Sorry. Thank you. So, Professor Ranjan, uh, he is an alumnus of the IIT KGP, Delhi University, and the University of California at Berkeley, where he completed his PhD. Currently, the Vice Chancellor of T.Y. Patel University, Pune, and former head of TIFAC, India's technology think tank. I'm sure everyone's heard of it. And his interests range from uh, highly uh, uh, arcane areas like new nuclear fusion, moon mission, wildlife tracking, assistive technology, and the BCI, the brain computer interface, a highly interesting and a complicated set of interests, I would say. And I would invite, I will invite Professor Ranjan now to talk on the role of brain computer interface in neuro rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krona. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> So as mentioned, uh, the title of my talk today is Role of Brain Computer Interface in Neuro Rehabilitation. Before I start, I'd like to put a disclaimer. I'm a scientist with basic background in nuclear fusion. And I'm also happy to inform the audience that for the first time in the country, outside one national lab, I have started a nuclear fusion program in country with investment from uh, private investors from Silicon Valley. Uh, nuclear fusion is the toughest challenge of the century, technological challenge. In fact, it was the toughest challenge of the last century. We could not solve it. Now it's the toughest challenge of this century. I'm happy to be able to inform you that the first time in the country we started this work as a private entity. But to just tell you, I'm not an expert of neuroscience. I'm not a medical doctor, healthcare professionals. So keep that in mind. Of course, this area of work requires a lot of interdisciplinary expertise. And so I bring some expertise from my side. Most of the work that I'm going to be reporting was done from 2008 to 2013, so more than 10 years ago, uh, started in, at Dhirubhai Yaman Institute of ICT in Gandhinagar. But when I was heading India's technology think tank in Delhi, I didn't have time to, to work on these, although I tried to do some amount of that, but it was not education institute, so it was difficult. Now that I'm back to education institute, I have started this work uh, in my university again, and I'm happy to collaborate with uh, many of you who are willing in this field. Uh, the way I got into this area was that through a student project, we developed a hand gesture based in environment control system to help persons with restricted finger movement. Then as we started to see that we could make change in, in the quality of life of people, we started to find other users coming forward with different needs. Then we worked out a plan to use any ability, focus on the ability of the person and improve their quality of life with the use of technology. For example, this is a device by which through your gesture you can control things around you, like television, air conditioner, music systems, and so on, computers. Uh, you can see a girl using a kazal, another girl, uh, Parvati, using the same device. Both of them have uh, cerebral palsy. We made another device to make it a little easier for those who cannot move around because you need to have remote control pointing towards the device. We made a device which allowed them to control things for up to four equipments in the room. You can see uh, parts using this. 
Sumit and Rohit in Delhi trying this out, watching cricket match. We also developed touch skin based apps to, to provide facility to those who could not uh, were non-verbal. Receive rewards and, and funds for some of these. So my focus has been on counting the ability and not the disability. Focus on what the person can do rather than the, what the person cannot do. Based on this, on the left side of this table, what you see is the ability of a person. For example, can the person move a hand or a leg? Can the person move ahead? Can the person speak? Or can he capture his eye movements or eye blinks or facial expressions or even conscious thought or muscle movement? And then, of course, touch skin with the technology also came in. The right side, what you see is the different technologies that we used. The green means we have done those things given to users. Yellow means that it was done in the lab, not given to users and uh, white means it is still needs to be done. So my focus of today's talk will be on the BCI part. You see that covers uh, three areas, eye movements, eye blink, facial expression, and some uh, cases concerns thoughts as well. These are the green ones. What we do is to take from user the input based on their ability, and then allow them to control various things like light, fan, television, computer, being able to speak, operating wheelchair, and other things like simple electrical machinery and so on. I'll not go into those details. So let me come to, to this particular area, which uh, we named as Brain Sipal when we started. As you are aware that interpretation of, interpretation of EEG waves is a complex task, and most of the work was done offline by recording waves and doing analysis later. But over the last 10 to 12 years, the development of embedded systems and more powerful processes became possible to carry out real-time analysis of these signals. This combined with wireless communication led to development of neuro headsets, which did not require you to be wired and you could move around and still uh, you could be monitored. These systems measure the EG waves and partially process the signal before they transmit it through the wireless communication to the computer for more sophisticated analysis. Initial use of this started to come into games market and games market being very large, these headsets started to become very cheap. And this made it possible for a person like me to take advantage of these to help persons with disability at a much lower cost and for wider uh, uses. So what happened due to this is that the probing of brain has come out of labs and hospitals into hands of persons like me who are not into the medical labs or hospitals. So for example, you can see some of the examples. Uh, these devices started to flood the market. I got hands on, uh, I saw one device in 2010, 2011, I could procure it. But you can see the way it is being used. For example, there's an artistic EEG helmet, which responds to the brain waves uh, in a way that it creates a relaxing loop. Similarly, you can see a 3D printed helmet response to brain waves in ways that an artist can imagine. It is not for medical intervention by any means. Let me come to my own work on brain computer interface. It was in July, on July 1st, 2011, uh, 10 years ago, that I first demonstrated that use, through my use of facial expressions, I can control things like light, fan, and so on. So for example, through my smile or blink of my eyes, I could control things. Uh, this was demonstrated, two of these are uh, my engineers, and one of them is my student. I was demonstrating in my office in Gandhinagar. The first user after effort we tried to find users was a gentleman, Mr. Suresh who was I'm Ahmedabad MBA, he had a brain stem stroke in 1999 at the age of uh, 32. He lost his hand and leg movement and he didn't have voice. He can hear and see. So he went into what is uh, referred to the locked-in condition. He could only communicate through a blink of his eyes. So on March 13 and 14 of 2012, we provided him with this device, which his wife told me that had changed his life because he started to use computers like blocks that he continues to do till today. I don't think I'll be able to show the video properly. So I'll just tell that what we're doing is that we actually capture the head movement. And then that head movement is translated into mouse cursor movements, so left, right movement of head, and up, down movement of head leads to cursor movement. And then we give him soft keyboard. And then with the blink of eyes, we map it to left mouse click. Using this, he can type on the computer. The first time he started using this, on 13th March 2012, about uh, nine years ago, was to type his wife's name. Then we demonstrated to him how he could control a light bulb uh, using his blink of his eyes. 
Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a light that is glowing and you can see smiling on his face. And then he again puts it off and then again puts it on. In fact, he bursts into laughter like a child at the end of this. Then we also allowed, uh, made a device, we gifted him on his birthday on 6th April 2012, which allowed him to speak through this device. There are other examples that I can't go into details. This is Charu Khandal in June 2012 in Kokla Ben Hospital in Mumbai. Unfortunately, she's no more. Uh, other gentleman, other gentleman from in, at Kokla Ben Hospital, this gentleman at Hyderabad, uh, this uh, boy at Patna, uh, this boy at uh, Mumbai. So many of these users uh, tried it and some of them use it. Uh, of course, in uh, during the last 10 years, we've lost few of them as well. So the device that we used initially was Emotive, a company called Emotive, Emotive Epoch, which has 14 electrodes, along with two axis gyro sensors to measure head movements. And this uh, was a completely wireless. At that time, it cost about $300 to purchase. What we do is to capture three kinds of things. One is facial expressions, other is emotions, and third is certain cognitive uh, conscious thoughts, for which we need to train the device up to four uh, conscious thought we need to train for each individual. Other ones need slight adjustment, but mostly it's generic, it can be recognized much more easily. We also try to use this to see if we can get a person in vegetative state to communicate. Of course, it is not really vegetative state, it is really minimally conscious state, but many times uh, medical professionals uh, misjudge them to be in vegetative state. So we try to see if a person who is identified to be in a vegetative state, but actually in the minimal custom state, can we get them to communicate? Uh, we tried with few people. What we tried to do in this case was that we captured that in real time, we captured that 3D uh, move, uh, activity in the brain and then link it to, we ask them to imagine certain scenes and we link those two scenes. If they can imagine those and there's a correlation, then we can link say, scene one and scene two, yes and no, and, and allow them to communicate through yes and no. I've not been successful. Now I'm restarting this work. As I said, that I could not uh, do this kind of work in my daily assignment. There are certain limitations of this, uh, and uh, we're trying to solve those. For example, the computer needs to be in the range of wireless uh, range of the headset. Uh, battery has a 12 hours of operation time. Uh, there's to be a requirement of wet contact. Now, dry contact based systems have also come, but they have less number of electrodes. Uh, based on this, I also started to focus on learning disability. I'll not go into details of these, but we have used brainwave entrainment and neurofeedback to help children with ADHD, ADD, and so on, Down syndromes, and also in, to adults in other cases like insomnia, depression, and so on. At Dwight Patel International University, what we are doing right now is to use brain computer interface to identify multiple intelligence among children and use this to improve their learning process and career choices. And then we are also using this to identify concentration levels and use neuroplasticity to improve ADHD and other conditions to help children learn much better. Work on the globe uh, as I mentioned the use of BCI is basically to provide a channel for communication and to make it possible to control the environment uh, for persons with severe and multiple physical disabilities. It can be used, I showed you some examples like computer as a computer cursors, virtual keyboards, augmentative and alternative access systems, prosthetic devices, wheelchairs, entertainment and gaming purposes. This was something that I mentioned made the neuro headset cheaper, internet browsing, painting and so on. And it has been used for people with ALS, multiple cirrhosis, brainstem and stroke. I give an example, muscular dystrophy. I had a gentleman in Delhi who is no more acquired brain injury, cerebral palsy, I have a few examples of that. So many of these conditions, we can use these. Basically what happens is this, that you acquire the signal, there's a processing of signal being done on the device. And in this trial, you actually suppress artifacts, extract features and classify the signals. And then it's connected to the device interface, depending on what is the application. For example, it could be lighting of a bulb or a wheelchair or a computer. And then sometimes there's a feedback system also that is there to perform certain tasks. And then we can classify BCI into three categories, invasive, non-invasive, and hybrid, which is a mix of these two. Uh, mostly what I have done is non-invasive because invasive, I cannot do it unless I'm uh, partnering with a medical uh, college. 
In the invasive thing, uh, most of you are aware, so I'm not going into details of these, but there are a few companies that have come into picture. There's a company called BrainGate, which has been around for some time. There's a company which has recently got FDA approval for human trials, Synchron, they have a strength road implant and Neuralink, uh, Elon Musk's company is in, in news. But the other ones have been earlier. The Synchron has got permission more recently. For example, BrainGate, you can see this gentleman in 2017 was able to reach with his paralyzed arm and hand in a clinical trial in 2017. He could grab the cup of coffee, hold a fork to feed himself and bring his hand to his face to scratch his nose. These things could be done about four years ago. Similarly, as I mentioned that FDA has clear synchronous brain computer phase device for human trials. This is invasive. Both of these I'm talking about are invasive devices. This device uh, takes around two hours to implant uh, using a minimally invasive procedure. The device is implanted through a blood vessel at the bottom of the neck and then maneuvered into the brain. This device could be available within three to five years uh, for uh, customers to buy and for medical colleges to utilize these. This gentleman, Graham, is the first one who tried uh, this out. He received this uh, uh, device. He suffers from ALS. The another second gentleman, uh, he is also using this to successfully control his computer. So more and more of this example is going to be growing there. I will not go into non-invasive BCI, but that's what I have used, but there are different ways we can use this. And of course, it's hybrid BCI. So I'll stop by talking at this point by saying that both invasive and non-invasive along with hybrid is playing a very important role in neuroadaptation. According to some estimates, they may, may become more pervasive than pacemakers that we are familiar with. So BCI along with other sensors can provide economic solutions for ASC, environmental control, wheelchair operation, and many other examples that I've showed. Indian researchers should focus on this area and we should have collaboration with academy and medical systems to make this possible. Thank you so very much for listening to me presently. Thank you so much, Professor Ran, for crossing talk and uh, providing insights into what AI is already doing. Uh, I would say of the has been made on lockdown butterfly which the lockdown state of famous Bradley Walk who was the editor of the magazine the French magazine. Uh, and uh, I think this uh, this this can be made into a movie how Mr. Suresh is working well with uh, right. He writes his blogs regularly for the last eight years. <laughs>